Okay, hello everybody. Thank you for taking the time to attend today's webinar that is discussing cell cycle analysis using flow cytometry. So my name is Stephanie Ping and I am ACS field application scientist currently based in Singapore. So you all are currently on mute, but if you do have any questions, please feel free to write a question in the chat portion and we can discuss this after the end of the seminar. So the main topics that we'll be discussing today will are how to do self-cycle analysis using DNA dyes, DRDU, Clicket EDU, and also proliferation-related antigens. So first off, what exactly is cell cycle? So as it's written here, it duplicates accurately the vast amount of DNA in the chromosomes and then segregate the copies precisely into two genetically identical daughter cells. Now this will occur either during normal cells for growth, replacement, or repair, or if immune cells are exposed to antigens or hormones, or during such cases as cancer, where the cells actually have loss of proliferative control. So the image at the bottom left shows the different stages of the cell cycle. So essentially, immediately following cell division, or mitosis, the cell enters the G1 phase, where the cellular growth occurs, including replication of organelles, followed by transitioning into the S phase of the cell cycle, in which the DNA itself is actually duplicated. This then allows progression into the G2M phase. So this is the phase of rapid cell growth and protein synthesis to prepare for mitosis. The final step where cellular components are divided equally and division occurs producing two identical cells. And this process will repeat itself as cells continue to proliferate. Now G1 and G2 are commonly referred to as gap phases and they serve as more than simple time delays to allow cell growth. They also provide time for the cell to monitor the internal and external environment to ensure that the conditions are suitable for preparations and are complete before the cell commits itself to the major upheavals of the F phase and by mitosis. Now specifically, the G1 phase is very important in this respect. So the length of the G1 phase will vary greatly depending on the external conditions and extracellular signals from other cells. So if the extracellular conditions are unfavorable, for example, if the cell delays progress to G1, they may also enter a specialized resting state known as G0, in which they can actually remain for days, weeks, or even years before resuming proliferation. So why is it actually important for us to do cell cycle analysis? So this can give us a basic idea of the certain effects due to treatments, such as the rest of the cells in the G0 or G1 phase. It can also let us know whether or not there's damage to the DNA. And in a more clinical situation, it will allow us to detect abnormal cells. So essentially, these histograms at the bottom, so the one on the top left is a normal histogram of a regular healthy cell, whereas all the rest of the histogram relates to malignant tissues. And we'll discuss in a later slide in terms of what is actually occurring here. So what is the basic concept for cell cycle analysis? So essentially, you will mark the DNA with a dye and run it through a flow cytometer. So with fluorescent markers, they are very weakly fluorescent when in solution, but they will fluoresce very brightly only when they're attached to DNA, which is typically why wash is not ne always necessary. So the amount of fluorescence is directly proportional to the amount of DNA that's found within the cell. So our key assumption is that if there are two times the amount of DNA, it will bind to two times the amount of dye. In the same vein, if there's two times the amount of dye that is found, then there should be two times the amount of fluorescence. So if we look at this histogram of the DNA bound to PI dye, so on the x-axis, we have the PI fluorescence intensity, and on the y-axis, we have the number of cells. You can see that through the two peaks, that the G2 phase, which is this point, has two times the amount of DNA in the G0, G1 phase, so 50 compared to 100. And then you have a distribution of the X phase in between. So when it actually comes to DNA analysis, there's a multitude of dyes that are actually available. And when it comes to choosing one, you really need to understand what is actually available within your flow cytometer. So the first point is which lasers are available. And second, which one of the channels are available to collect the emitted light. So in this chart right here, you can see that different dyes for UV are Hertz and Daffy. For the violet laser is a Hertz and Daffy dye also. For the blue laser, you have TI, Cyto, Cybergreen, 7AAD, and Drac2. And finally, for the red laser, we have Drac5. Sorry, uh, sorry, Drac5. 
that all the numbers within the brackets correlate to the optimal emitted um, wavelength. So in addition, other factors that you need to actually consider when you're choosing the dye is whether or not it's permeable to the cells. Permeable meaning whether or not it's able to penetrate intact cell membranes to stain the nucleic acids. So some examples of ways or different dyes that you can use to quantify the DNA content of live cells are Hirsch dyes, Cyto9, JAK2, and the vibrant dyes. So again, because these dyes can actually permeate the cell membrane, you do not actually need to fix the cells beforehand, before fix or permeate the cells before usage. So you can use this for live cell analysis. However, you have to also consider the fact that the dye itself can actually affect the viability of the cells. So for instance, with these images right here, this shows the viability and vitality of the cells after 72 hours of labeling with a dye. So the image at the top is the control cells, and you can see that the number of live cells is approximately 96.4%. Whereas when you label with the Hearst dye, DRAC5, and also dye cycle Ruby, there's also decreases with the actual viability of the cells afterwards, showing with the highest viability using dye cycle Ruby. So please take this into consideration if you're going to use this for live cell analysis. So on the opposite end, we also have impermeant dyes. So these can be specific to be used to identify dead cells. So in order to actually quantify the actual DNA content, you will need to fix and permeabilize the cells. So there are several different ways that this can be done. Most commonly, you can use either detergents or ethanols. And immediately after doing this, the cells are both fixed and permeabilized at the same time, which then allows the dye to directly access the DNA. However, if you are interested in staining the outer membrane first, then you would fix it in formaldehyde and then permeabilize it either using ethanol or detergent. To put this all together, if we have this chart again, you can then see what the colors just correlate to the specific laser that will optimally excite the dye. In terms of permeability, it was only PI and 7AED that are impermeable to cells. So these are the ones that you actually need to fix and perm the cells before the dye can actually stain the DNA. Finally, another point is that some dyes will actually stain both the DNA and RNA, such as the cytodyes dyes and PI. So in these specific situations, you do need to treat the cell with RNAase in order to remove the RNA so you will only stain the DNA. So before we move on, we also need to determine more definitions. So this is ploidity. So haploid is a definition for N for sex cells, such as the sperm and egg. For the G0 and G1 phase, these are called diploids, where you have two N normal number of sets of chromosomes. And finally, for the G2 phase, this is called a tetraploid, and you have four N number of chromosomes. So again, with G0 and G1, so this is the phase in which it's before DNA synthesis, the cells will then have a diploid 2N and have chromosomal DNA contents. So during the S phase, since this is in between G0, G1, and the G2 phase, these cells will contain between 2N to 4N amount of DNA. And finally, at the G2 M phase, the cells will then have 4N amount of tetraploidal chromosomal DNA contents. So what are the most common dyes that are actually used? So the first one is actually propylium iodide, otherwise known as PI. So this is a dye that's relatively affordable, which is why it is used more often. It's excited by the blue laser with 488 nanometers, and it's optimally emitted at 617 nanometers. So again, this is impermeant to live cells. So you can use it for a live dead stain if you want to specifically only stain the dead cells within the sample. However, if you want to actually use it specifically for cell cycle analysis, you again, you will need to fix and permeabilize the cells beforehand. So again, PI dye will stain both double-stranded RNA and double-stranded DNA, meaning before actually staining the cells, you will then need to do an RNAase treatment in order to degrade the RNA. So the other more common dye is 7AED. So this is DNA-specific meaning you do not actually need to use RNA's treatment. This is also excited by the 488 at or 530 nanometers, and the emitted peak is at approximately 650 nanometers. 
This is impermeant to live cells, meaning you do need to fix and perm the cells before you actually stain it for the DNA. Otherwise, you can use the dye itself as the discriminator of live and dead cells. So what are some differences in terms of the usage of PI versus 7AAB? So in this example on the right, we're using a T cell line. And in the first histogram, we have the T cells that were fixed and perm, RNA is treated, and then stained with PI. And you can see you have a very clean DNA profile. Whereas if you compare this to T cell lines that were not treated with RNAs, you can see that there are several more events that have occurred. And this is the fact that PI will stain for both RNA and DNA. So if you do not actually treat with RNAs before you stain it with PI, you'll actually overestimate the amount, number of events within all the different phases. Finally, if you actually just treat this with 7AAD, and again, because 7AAD will only stain the DNA, you do not actually need to use RNAs treatment. And as you can see, the resulting histogram of treatment with 7AAD compared to the RNAs treated PI are quite similar in those situations. So for cell cycle analysis, and in general for flow cytometry, it's always important to take into account whether or not you have doublets in your sample. So in order to further understand this, let's look at this right here. So we have the laser beam and your particle or cell that is passing through the laser. Here on the right, you have the time on the x-axis and the voltage on the y-axis. So as the particle goes through the laser beam, you can see that this voltage will increase to a maximum when the particle itself is directly inside the beam. And as it exits, you will then have this resulting curve. So putting this all together, there are three parameters that will be taken with every voltage pulse. So the first one is height, which is commonly used to represent the data on the plot. So this is the actual height of the voltage pulse. You then have the width, so essentially the amount of time it takes for the particle to pass by, pass through the laser. And broad signal widths can actually indicate coincidence counts, doublets, or clumping. And we're going to go into more details about this on the next slide. And finally, if you actually shade in the entire area in the signal, that is called the area itself. So what are doublets and aggregates? So let's take a G1 cell that's in the G1 phase, a cell that's in the G2 phase, and two G1 cells that are attached together. So if these cells were staying for some type of a DNA dye, such as PI, if the G1 cell passes through the laser beam, you will have a defined width and height and area. So again, since the cells are in the G2 phase, should have two times the amount of DNA, thus two times the amount of fluorescence, you will have approximately the same width and twice the height, so therefore approximately double the amount of area. Now, if you have two G1 cells, the amount of time it actually takes to go through the laser beam will be double, so the width itself will be double, but since these are G1 cells, the height itself will only be one meaning the total area of the two G1 cells compared to the total area of the G2 cell will be approximately the same. So if you included these doublets with your analysis, you will actually be overestimating the number of cells that are in the G2 phase. So how do you actually remove this from the analysis? First off, you will plot your cells for floor scatter versus side scatter and date out your cells of interest. You then plot all of the events that are within this gate with forward scatter height versus forward scatter area. So here you can see the singlet is found within this area and the singlet which may be in the G2 phase will be found higher. Whereas the doublet would have the same amount of height but two times the area, which is why they're found up around this point. So you would want to gate closely around this area right here or this area right here in this graph. So as our first example, we have A549 cells that were treated either with curcumin, which causes cell cycle arrest at the G2 or M phase, MG132, which is causes cell cycle arrest at G2 or M phase, and finally 5SU, which will arrest the cells at the G1 or G0 phase. So all of these cells were then washed, fixed, treated with RNAase, 
and stained with procuridium iodide. And finally, analyze this stuff, analyzed by flow cytometer. So first off, let's analyze the control. So again, you get out your cells of interest at the forward scatter and side scatter plot. Then you gate all the events within, sorry, you plot all the events within this gate with forward scatter height versus forward scatter area and gate out your doublets. If you want to do even further doublet discrimination, you can plot this with the fluorescence area versus width. So essentially, even if this cell is in G1 or G2, the width of it should be approximately the same. So anything to the right of this gate would also be considered doublets. And finally, you will then plot the histogram for PI, or with all of the events that is found within the R3 gate, and you will have this clear peak for the G1 and G2 phase. So if you use the Nova Express software that is co that comes complementary with the Nova site, this also includes the Watson module. And this is a mathematical module that will determine the total percentage of cells that are found in the G1 phase, G2 phase, and also the S phase. So you can see right here within the control cells, 78.06% of the cells are in the G1 phase, 19.66% are found in the S phase, and 3.84% is found in the G2 phase. So how about the compound treated A549 cells? So you can see here, again using the Watson plot, when it's treated with curcumin at 100 micromolars, the cells are stuck in the G2 or M phase and has been increased by approximately 12%. In the same vein, when you have treatment with 10 micromolars of MG132, you have the cells which has been increased to 29.25% in the G2 phase, and treatment with 5-FU has increased the percentage of cells in the G1 phase to 67.58%. So this is some basic cell cycle analysis that you can use with single staining. So for DNA analysis in a clinical situation, they find that many tumors will show either or both altered DNA content and also increased proliferation. Therefore, the diploid index may show prognostic significance in addition to the S phase fraction. So some definitions in ploidity is, again, with the total amount of the DNA in the nucleus of the cell, is called the 2N or diploid amount of DNA. And this, of course, is specific to the type of organism that is in question. So for normal cells, these are called euploid or normal diploid with 2N amount of chromosomes. Tetraploid has four chromosomes, so that's 4N. And when it comes to abnormal cells, these are referred to as aneuploid or DNA aneuploid. Hyperdiploids are peaks with more DNA than normal cells, so more than 4N, and hypodiploid are peaks with less DNA than normal cells, so that's less than 2N. So if you look at a normal cell versus malignant tissues, so here are the histogram plot of a normal euploid or normal diploid, and finally, the ones that we showed earlier on in this presentation are cells that are taken from malignant tissues. So you can see that we have hyperdiploid and hypodiploid peaks in these all of these different areas, showing that with this very easy screen, you can see that possibly these cells are cancerous. So what if you are more interested in quantifying the amount of cells that are within the S phase? This can actually be done using thymidine analogs. So typically when the cells are going through the S phase, they will uptake thymidine, meaning if you add a thymidine analog, this will be inserted into replicating DNA and effectively tag dividing cells, allowing the characterization. This quantitative measure of cell kinetics in combination with DNA dye can also be used as a measure of apoptosis. So there are two different types of thymidine analogs. The first one is halogenated, such as BRDU, IDU, and CIDU. And the second type is azide-derivized, which is EDU. So with regards to the halogenated thymidine analogs, the most commonly used one is BRDU. The main limitations of BRDU is that it can only be detected indirectly using a BRDU antibody. And in order to accomplish this, you need to actually do DNA-DNA tuberization, either using acid, heat, or nuclease. So they may have significant differences between cell types regarding their sensitivity 
to DNA denaturization. So you must try different types of acid nucleotide concentrations and also different temperatures to find the conditions that are best suited for your cell type. And there's always going to be a trade-off between good anti-BRDU labeling versus the retention of sufficient DNA signal for DNA content analysis. In addition, this DNA neutralization denaturization can cause cell cycle arrest at the G1 or S phase border at high concentrations. So as an example of BRDU, you can actually double stain it with 7AAD to stain the DNA. So in this example, the cells were pulsed with 10 micromolars of BRDU for 30 minutes. So in R6 over here, so on the x-axis, we have 7AAD, so this is for the DNA and BRDU on the y-axis, which will stain the cells that are in the S phase. So R6 is the apoptotic cells determined by their sub-G0 and G1 levels of DNA. R3, which is this block, which is this gate right here, are the cells within the G0 and G1 phase and constitute approximately 39% of the cells within the cell cycle. R4 is the ones that are positive for BRDU are the cells that are in the S phase which constitute approximately 39%. And finally, R5, which is the one at the bottom right, are the cells that occupy the G, T, or M phase, which is only 14%. Also, please note that the BRDU incubation time depends on how rapidly the cells divide. Primary cells may need up to 24 hours, while rapidly proliferating cell lines may need only one hour. So the exact time required to achieve the optimal signal-to-noise ratio should be optimized before your experiment. So as another example, here you can use BRDU over a time scale experiment. So you have time zero, time four hours, eight hours, and 14. So on top, you have DNA versus BRDU, and here is the DNA histogram. So clearly you can see the progression of the cells to the S phase, with this difference in, chain, in terms of the expression of BRDU, which correlates well to the DNA histogram. So here are some data that was courtesy, that was courtesy of Kylie Price from the Malacan in New Zealand. And these are HL660 cells that are staying with BRDU at time zero, two hours, four hours, six hours, eight hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, and that the single stain. So again, you'll have the DNA, so DAPI on the x-axis and the BRDU on the y-axis. So clearly you can see how the cells will cycle through the S phase within 0, 2, 4, 6, and 8. However, when we reach 24 to 48 hours, there's a rapid decline or rapid um, decrease in the amount of cells that are staying for BRDU. So what actually happens here? So in this situation, it's possible that the concentration of anti-BRDU was actually not high enough. So with all of your experiments, please optimize the amount of antibody that is required. So moving on to azide revised thymidine analogs. So this was a breakthrough in tagging DNA synthesis using thymidine analog, analog EDU. So the alkaline group in EDU is readily detected using a fluorescent azide probe and copper cat catalysis with quick chemistry. So this rapid two-step biolabeling approach allows the tagging of DNA within cells without the need of harsh cell treatment. This will then preserve the structural and molecular, molecular integrity of the cells, and it also simplifies assaying considerably, and the results you achieve are similar to, or actually better than those achieved using BRDU. So again, some pros using this method is we do not have to do the DNA denaturation, meaning you have a faster staining process than BRDU with 30 minutes compared to two hours. Now some cons, through a publication, they found that once it has been incorporated into DNA, into the DNA, it can also induce DNA damage signaling. And this damage is actually higher than BRDU with longer uh, exposure. In addition, with the high copper content with EDU, this will affect some fluorescent proteins such as GFP and YFP and fluorophores such as the Q dots, M cherry, PE, and Tamandis. So they did come up with something that's called Cricket Plus EDU, and this actually has a copper protectant component, which then makes the EDU compatible with GFP, M cherry, and PE. However, the main downfall of this is the fact that it's quite expensive. 
So again, with some data that's courtesy and proudly priced from the Malahan, we have HL60 cells that were stained with Plicket EDU, and this was then done at zero hours, two, four, six, eight, 24, and 48 hours. So in this specific situation, the actual changes in the S phase are all captured. However, you can see at 48 hours, there's then this one population down here. So what actually went wrong? So this decrease in the DAPIA MAF5 from T0 to 48 is potentially due to insufficient DNA binding dye to achieve equilibrium and stoichiometric staining. So if you have insufficient DAPI, then the distributions themselves will move left and the G2, G1 ratio will then start to decrease. So a potential solution to this is to ensure that the dye and the cell salt concentrations are sufficient to achieve stoichiometric staining, meaning please count your cells before you actually stain them. So for instance, we've counted within this gate and the total count of all events here between 0, 24, and 48 hours increases from 21,000 to 41,000 cells. So clearly, even though there is enough DAPI between the T0 to T24 hour concentrations, the number of cells in the time 48 hours was far too high in order to be fully stained with the DAPI concentration. So what if I want to visualize alterations in the S phase progression of the drug treatment? So this is one method in which we have dual pulse labeling of the S phase with both clicky EDU and BRDU. So in the first image right here of 3A, for the first pulse, they labeled with EDU alone. And this is then incorporated into the cells that are replicating DNA for one hour. So that's the cells that are in the S phase. Then after this one hour, BRDU is added for a second pulse for one hour without actually washing out the EDU. So cells will preferentially uptake BRDU over EDU. So cells that have already completed DNA synthesis will not incorporate BRDU and display EDU only. So that's this population that's red right here. So cells that are newly entering the S phase will incorporate BRDU and display BRDU only. So that is this green portion right here. And finally, cells that were in the S phase during both pulses will display both EDU and BRDU. And that is the center portion in which they're actually overlapping. So if you put this all together, so the EDU alexafluor over here and BRDU fits C right here in the different quadrant gates. So the cells that are colored light blue, so within this double negative quadrant, are cells that are negative for both EDU and BRDU. So essentially cells that are either in the G0, G1 phase or the G2 phase. Cells that are colored for dark blue, which is this top right-hand corner, are positive for both EDU and BDU, BRDU, meaning that they were actually actively synthesized in DNA and in the S phase during the first and second pulse. Cells that are colored red are positive for EDU, but negative for BRDU. So these are positive for only the first pulse, which is that of the EDU. And finally, cells that are colored green are negative for EDU, but positive for BRDU. So these are the cells that are synthesizing DNA only in the second pulse. So let's put this into an actual example. So in this first example, your cut cells were treated with 20 micromolars of EDU for one hour. They were then fixed in ethanol and an acid denaturation method before labeling with anti-BRDU and click alexafluor to detect EDU, and also cytox blue to stain the nucleic acid. So with all the graphs, the first one is a histogram for EDU. So this second one is a histogram for BRDU, and finally here is a histogram for the DNA content. This plot right here is with EDU compared to BRDU, DNA compared to EDU, and DNA compared to BRDU. So of course, this first peak right here is negative for the stain. And because in this specific situation, the cells were treated with only EDU, we only have a positive peak for the EDU and no positive peak for BRDU. This is further quantified, further verified with the EDU versus DNA content. So you can see the cells in S phase that were stained with EDU and no stain for BRDU. In the second example, Eurocat cells were treated with 10 micromolars of BRDU for one hour. 
fix, denatured, and then stain. So this specific situation, we would only expect the cells to actually stain positively for BRDU, which is represented by this positive peak only in the BRDU histogram and positive S phase cells in DNA versus BRDU. In the next one, eukaryotic cells were treated with both 20 micromolars of EDU and 10 micromolars of BRDU together for one hour. And remember, we've previously mentioned that cells will preferentially uptake BRDU over, over EDU. So you can see in the situation when they're both added into the medium at the same time, the cells will only stain positively for BRDU, which is shown with this positive peak on the histogram and the positive cells in the S phase, and nothing positive for EDU. And finally, in the last example, the cells were treated with 20 micromolars of EDU for one hour, and then followed by 10 micromolars of BRDU for another hour without the removal of EDU or washing of the cells. And in this situation, we then have a positive peak for both EDU and BRDU. So again, when you actually have it plotted, this is the percentage of cells that are in the G0, G1, or G2 phase. Here is in orange is the cells that were in the S phase during the first hour. The ones that are green are the number of cells that were in the S phase during the first hour and the second hour. And finally, the purple cells are the cells, purple um, events are the cells that were in the S phase only during the second pulse with BRDU. So this is a great way in order to determine what happens with the DNA synthesis when you have certain things such as chemical treatments. So finally, the last method is using proliferation-related antigens. So these can be combined with DNA staining to either obtain antigen expression, phase differentiation, and finally, a DNA profile of the selected subset. So the first one is proliferating cell nuclear antigens, otherwise known as PCNA. So this is elevated specifically only in the G1 or S phase. Then there's also a protein called KI67, which is absent in G0, low in G1, and the highest in G1, S phase, G2, and M phase. You can also take into account cyclins. So for instance, cyclin B is only expressed in the M phase, cyclin D in the G1, cyclin E in the late G1 and early S phase, cyclin A in the S phase and early G2, and finally cyclin A, CDK1, and G2 early and early M phase. So all of these, again, can be combined with DNA staining in order to differentiate different phases within the cell cycle. So that concludes my presentation on cell cycle analysis. So the main take-home message is to first determine what type of experiment you want to do. So for instance, if you're most interested in quantifying the S phase, then use BRDU or EDU and combine this with a DNA stain. And after you have determined what type of experiment you'd like to do, when you're choosing your dyes, take into account your flow cytometer and which lasers they have and also the configuration and choose the appropriate DNA dye that is actually suitable for that system. So if you have any further questions or would you like any further information, you can email me at sting at acabile.com and you can find out more information about our flow cytometer called the Novocyte at www.acabile.com.